Hi everyone, this is Suzanne Wagner. Um, my section today is called The Clash of the Titans of Ballet. I come out of the elevator and there is a buzz of excitement filling the hallways at the School of American Ballet. All of the young dancers were so excited. I have never seen the school in quite such a dither. The word was out. There were big stars in the studios. At first, all I heard was that they were going to take Stanley Williams' class. Who? I asked. One girl younger than myself said, Peter Schofis, Peter Martins, Mikhail Bereshnikov, and Rudolf Nureyev are all warming up together in the studio. Young Borzoi-like girls were all crowding around the, the doorways that allowed entry into Stan Stan Stanley Williams' class, along with a few windows that also allowed a peek into what was happening inside. Every girl was trying to poke her head in the doorway. It was a circus of bubbly baby ballerinas wanting to get a chance to take a look at real stars in the ballet world. Many girls were twittering outside the door and you could tell that these stars of the ballet world knew exactly what was happening. While this might be a class for those amazing principal male dancers right now, this was a performance for the young dancers and these male dancers knew it. They were all smiling, laughing, stretching, completely aware of the impact that they were having in the space of so many starry-eyed young women that were gazing longingly at the door. The young male students in the class were trying very hard not to stare and had their very best mature and competent faces on. You could tell they were very nervous, but they had a very serious look and their concentration was heightened in that moment. There was clearly an edge of tension in the studio. They were in the presence of greatness and they knew such opportunities were rare. Because they were not professional ballet dancers, these young men that had these young men knew that they had the chance to watch four very different principal male dancers in class and that would be an extraordinary moment. They knew that this was the chance of a lifetime. Many of the young girls had to go off to classes as their classes started at the same time. I had more time this day as I had my big class in the morning and I was waiting to have my pas de deux class which was after the men's class. I had planned on sewing point shoes and bringing them in before the class because a pas de deux class required a lot of point work and the shoes needed to be strong and solid under your weight for partnering. I decided once the throngs of ballerinas thinned out that I was going to go back and forth between sewing, sewing shoes and watching their class. I knew that the beginning of the class as the, I knew that the beginning of the class as bar would be less interesting because that was not where the fireworks appeared in male dancing. But I knew that watching the center with all the jumping and turning would be spectacular. I was looking forward to that. I sat in the studio next door with that was empty and sewed shoes as quickly as I could. I wanted to watch the class as it continued to the center exercises. What I did not know was that I was about to witness a game where powerfully talented men subtly competed. I was about to witness the combined deference to Rudolf Nureyev by the other three male dancers. I was about to witness the playful com competition that men naturally need to engage in. It was amazing to see such a magnificent chess match of understated elegance, intense competition mixed with playful banter, always with the differential icing of acknowledgement for the grand dame of the ballet world, Rudolf Nureyev. Looking in the classroom, it was a feast of beautiful male bodies. Peter Martin's was elongated elegance, finesse, and charisma. He moved like a panther with grace and virtuosity. He was the crowned king of New York City Ballet, and he knew it. He had a statuesque elegance of a Michelangelo sculpture. He had that look of a classical male danseur. Peter Schofis was a Danish powerhouse of spins and perfect placement. He had an ease with his jumps that allows complicated things to seem effortless. He knew how to fly and suspend time in the air. Because of his shorter and stockier frame, he displayed the power of a coiled spring inside with a graceful balance. Mikhail Bereshnikov was playful, sincere in his game of competition. It was clear that he was in competition with himself and no one else. 
he had a boyish charm and was a gentleman, respectful, kind-hearted, and generous. He was a steady in technique and placement. His unpretentious smile could melt the hearts of every girl in the vicinity. While Berezhnikov and Peter Shofus were the shorter of the four, Berezhnikov shined like a star that he was. He was currently the uncontested best male dancer in the world and at that time. He was also clearly the most relaxed in the space. He played the game and stood out by not appearing to play the obvious game in the room. But Rudy was a type of star that refused to give up the limelight to anyone. He commanded the room and demanded the bulk of the attention in the space towards him. He had a type of magnetism that refused to be invisible, and he had a type of hunger inside that I could feel and relate to. While Rudy was like Brezhnikov, in that he did not have the perfect body compared to Peter Martin's, Rudy knew that it was something inside him that made him great, and he knew that because he believed in that greatness. He demanded that others recognize it as well. I knew that what was about to happen was going to be very interesting. Stanley Williams was in rare form and was teaching a very complicated class that demanded many levels of expertise with playful combination that teased the mind and tortured the body. It was a perfect class for these well-seasoned professional dancers, exactly what they came to have and what they wanted to experience to test their mind and skills. One needs challenges at this level of dance and such great teachers are hard to find and are not always found in professional ballet companies as I was eventually to learn. There is an eagerness from young dancers that I believe can bring out the best in teachers, and certain teachers such as Stanley Williams love to cultivate and refine that youthful audacity into greatness. Throughout the class, all of these men were appearing to humbly play a game of King of the Hill. During combinations and exercises, they casually would bounce off each other. Each knew what the other had as far as talent and skill. Each respected the other, but the winning ego was always going to be Rudolf Nureyev. That was clear even to my young eyes. It was clear to me, even at 16 years old, that Rudy had to win in any game of competition. It was just how he was built. Everyone knew and studied the history of Rudolf Nureyev. Every dancer wanted to know how certain dancers make it while others don't. I knew that as a student, Nureyev started late, and because of that, his ferocious determinations, what, determination was what had made him and shaped him to become a star. His huge ego was a part of his personality, style, and he loved to work that power and influence at every opportunity. I could see by his dancing quality the way he moved, and his tartar passion was there from the very beginning. I was to discover as I got older that it would never leave him in this life. Rudolf Nureyev was literally born on a moving train in the cold Russian winters. That was no accident. In his heart, he was a nomad, a free spirit. He refused to allow the projections of others to influence how he felt about himself, who he thought he was, or who he was going to become. During the class, he would playfully banter with Stanley Williams. It was with great respect and not rude in any way. He clearly liked Stanley Williams and used the torturous combinations to show off Flash's brilliant smile and bring more attention to himself. As these male titans on Mount Olympus sparred with each other, it was interesting to watch how they sorted themselves out once they got into the center. In ballet, there are rules as to where someone stands in the class at the bar, but also in the center. Because of so many male, uh, so many dancers in the room, groups are formed that take turns doing combinations while others stand in the back and watch, going over the sequences in their mind and looking at others to learn from regarding style, finesse, and subtle command over one's body. Not surprisingly, Peter Martins went in the first group. This was, after all, his studio and his home. He was the uncontested Balanchine male dancer. And it was clear that he was very familiar with Stanley's style and what he required the men to show and express. Peter, Cho Peter Schofus chose to be in the second group. Peter did not appear to move from the positions of ego, yet he knew who he was and what he offered. He did not try to emulate Peter Martins, as he had his own personal style and a, a person he's his own personal style, and to him that was perfect. He displayed a type of calm confidence that was not flashy, though it was meticulous. 
While both Peter Martins and Peter Schofus were trained and danced with the Royal Danish Ballet, their personalities and temperaments were clearly very different. Berezhnikov took center stage with the third group. He exuded a very competent and professional attitude, and his approach to class held a serious tone of respect and great attention to detail. Berezhnikov seemed in that moment the most relaxed of the four, and yet his level of internal concentration and focus seemed superior in some odd way that at the time I could not put my finger on. I think he knew he could do almost anything. That level of self-awareness gives a type of self-assurance that is fearless and bold without swagger or arrogance. That left Rudy to command the fourth and final group. That was not surprising because he was the superstar. He taught me so much about presence and passion just standing there waiting for the music to start. He held a type of commanding cons commanding conceit that defined who he was while he defied any who would challenge his authority, talent, or ability. He knew that his job was to command the final group, and it was clear that no man could be presumptuous enough to even try to knock him off his hill. It was clear that the other men had great respect and great admiration for what he had accomplished in leaving the USSR. They understood the tremendous gifts that his talent had inspired in generations of dancers. As far as everyone was concerned, he'd earned that spot. I could see that in this class there was a very serious competition between the Dan Danish and the Russians, but outward appearances also allow for the unique styles, tastes, flows, and abilities of each other. The Danes utilized a level of finesse and exactitude. They loved to display the meticulous control that the Danish style was famous for. They appeared as expressions of effortless perfection that only rigorous training can offer. Their movement quality was fluid, cool, and peacefully understated. They were beautiful to watch and made everything look effortless. But Russians have a very different temperament. Russia is a huge country, wild and uncontrollable on many levels, and that Russian style is big, bold, brash, flamboyant, and wildly exuberant. They cannot help but have the mindset of go big or go home. While Bereshnikov was classy, caring, and consistent, there was a power inside him that had always determined that that had determined to find ways to coolly and calmly master difficult things with his mind and then allow that mind to train his body. He exuded a mastery of, of personal and professional self-control. Even at that time, it was clear to me that he was so much more than just the epitome of a Russian dancer. He seemed to look for freedom in his carefree attitude and ease that spoke volumes. He appeared to embrace differences that had a powerful drive to explore the edges of alternative movement. He seemed enthusiastic about Stanley Williams' style of movement, and he showed a type of curiosity and a desire to explore as many options as possible. Artistically, even to my young eyes, he seemed to be seeking new ways to dance to some inner silence that moved his heart and inspired his soul. Nureyev? was a storm of emotion, power, intensity, drama, arrogance, and reactivity. He was like a wild animal that could barely control the emotions that seemed to threaten to consume him. The energy he held inside seemed to be threatening to escape at any moment. He was a coiled Siberian tiger looking for its next meal, always hungry and ruthless in his pursuit to get what he wanted. To me, he was a tartar version of a Shabnam, or the trickster of the Persian mythology. It was clear that he lived and existed on the edges of accepted social behavior and norms. In Nureyev's movements and dance, it was clear that the values the world held, held had no place for him. His movement said to me that he would live his life breaking down as many systems of appropriate behavior, testing patience in everyone he met, and demanding to have things his way because he believed that he knew better. He seemed to love to test everyone's patience with great humor. His way of teasing seemed as if his intention was to stomp with muddy boots across the shiny floors of ballet. I saw, even, I saw him even then as the god of the thresholds. He defied limits in himself and others. He refused to back away from a challenge. To me, even at 16 years old, he was something between a coiled snake and a roaring lion. Both would bite and both intended to kill you. 
Watching such moments in dance, one learns about the protocols and subtle structures that rule a ballet class. Things got very interesting in Stanley as Stanley's class began the turn sequences. This was what I had been waiting for. The turns and jumps of the men are always the most spectacular. This was going to be the main event. Stanley Williams knows the game as well and decides to give a series of continuously more difficult turning combinations. Things get very interesting quickly. Stanley gives a series of alternating pirouette combinations that change direction, change sides, and change the type of pirouette being required. Changing angles in turn sequences is hard because how of how one spots or focuses where the eyes are looking alternates. All the men do this with great skill and control. Such types of terms, turns, where it starts and where one's one very controlled pirouette and then gracefully moves into a double turn only to change angles again. Switching back and forth is complicated, interesting to watch, and shows prowess with finesse. In that moment, the mood changed ever so slightly. Let the games begin. I found myself watching that I am part partially holding my breath, trying to feel what that level of turning ability mixed with such profound control must feel like. That was when Stanley Williams gave an amazing sequence and combination that ended with a twirling finish that allowed for these virtuosos to spin as many pirouettes as they could to finish. Peter Martins is first up. In the turning reality, he is a showman. He is all elegance, grace, and understated power. He finishes with five perfectly positioned pirouettes. With the softness of a cat landing, he closes into a perfect fifth position. There is an audible gasp from the peanut gallery. He smiles and walks to the back of the room. Next up is Peter Schofus. He is known to be an excellent turner, and he does the entire exercise, adding one extra turn for each one that Peter Martins did. But he is different in that as his natural flow um, and presentation is less elegant than Peter Martin's, but he is clearly in his element and his turns appear effortless. His final pirouette is so perfectly positioned and controlled that as he slows down for the final of six, pirouettes, notice one more than Peter Martin's, he stops perfectly forward, still on demi point with a perfect passe position, and slowly slides his leg up and over his knee to close in fifth position on demi point before he closes and ends in a plie. Now, all the ballerinas are feeling the excitement in the air, with the men allowing this testosterone game to continue. We are all now in anticipation of what might come next. Bereznikov is now up, and we are at the edges of our seats because he is known for his amazing turning ability. We know that pretty much no one could beat him at this game. Sure enough, with his clear blue eyes and sharp focus, he now does one more pirouette in the sequences than Peter Schofus and ends with eight perfectly positioned Russian-styled turns, finishing with a nonchalance and an attitude of casual grace. As he turns to go to the back of the room, and as the next group is coming forward, he flashes that boyish charm our way with those Russian blue eyes, and all of us in the corner melt under that smile that could melt Siberia. Now, here comes Nureyev. The way he decides to purposely walk to the front of the room tells us that he knows he has to do one more pirouette than Brezhnikov. There is a look in those brown eyes that seem to burn with a greenish hue of determination. I can tell that he needs to win. He will win regardless of the cost. He attacks the combination with a furiosity that can be felt throughout the room. You could have heard a pin drop. No one is breathing. The two Peters know what is up and walk uh, and watch casually from the back. Brezhnikov has hit, put his leg up on the bar and is stretching nonchalantly, pretending to not watch. But I notice that as he stretches and Nureyev is finishing that last long spin, 
He ever so slightly turns his head to watch as he is leaning forward to stretch his hamstrings with one leg up on the bar. For that last pirouette, Nureyev winds up like a top, sets his jaw, his eyes have gone black, and I see the pulse of his heartbeat in his neck. He is turning to the right, which means he will releve on his left leg and place his right foot in a passe on his left knee while he turns. Before he does that, he swings his arms hard to the left so that he has great force to use in the term. He is seriously intent in this action. As the turn begins, he is spinning, and as the spins get past four or five, he is off balance. That requires him now to have to take a hop on his standing left leg to keep going around. Normally, most dancers would just finish rather than hop, but this moment, Rudy needs to, be the, needs to do one more than Berezhnikov. Hopping into the last ninth pirouette, he finishes raggedly, but with a smirk of satisfaction. He finishes and the room erupts in applause. Those applause were not because he did one more. They were for his determination to keep going no matter what. I was to learn so much more about Nureyev's determination in just a few years, but in that moment, everyone really wanted him to win. We want our heroes to remain heroes and stars forever. After that, I was inspired to go into the next studio, put on my point shoes and practice pirouettes. Each of those four male dancers had a personal way that they set up the turns. I wanted to try them all out to see if one worked for me better than another. As I am practicing, I hear the class door fit at the class next door finish up. But I am not paying attention because I am concentrating on trying to figure out the various ways that New York City Ballet's style of turns happens to begin from different start positions with a bent front leg and a straight back leg, whereas the Russian format of preparation for a turn uses a double plie. That is when I hear a man's voice with a Russian accent say clearly, he's so simple. I look over and here is Bereshnikov smiling and standing in the doorway to the studio with his arms folded, watching me. Stunned, I stop what I am doing and suddenly I don't know what to say as I am starstruck. It is one thing to watch a star that you hold in high esteem, but quite another to suddenly be face to face with one of the greatest stars of the ballet world and have to figure out what to say. I can feel myself flush bright red and my heart is racing. I finally managed to say, I I'm sorry, what did you say? He smiles knowingly, knowing he has flustered me, and says softly, It's so very simple. Let me show you. I think in my mind, is he kidding? He wants to help me? Seriously? I he comes over with a towel across his neck, tosses the towel to the side, and proceeds to give me a lesson in the Russian way of turning. He takes his time going into great detail as to why the Russian train this way, and we take turns turning. I can't believe it. I'm a in a room with Bereshnikov, and he is teaching me personally how to turn. Is this moment real? Slowly, I begin to relax, partially because he keeps telling me that you can't turn with so much tension, and that I need to learn to relax. I am clearly not breathing, and he points that out as well. He does not understand that it is his presence that is making me not breathe, though I can't imagine that he does not know the effect he has on young women. What I did not know until later was that he was probably working on the movie that he did with Leslie Brown called Turning Point, which came out in 1977. At that time, it was the summer of 1976 in New York. Brezhnikov was totally kind to me and so very helpful. He even had me laughing by the end of this short 15-minute personal class on pirouettes. He stopped when I succeeded in turning around five times on point doing, during a pirouette. At that time, that was the most I had ever managed to do, ever. I felt very proud of myself. He congratulated me and told me to keep on trying as he grabbed his towel, throws it over his shoulder, smiling one last time in my direction with a thumbs up 
as he walked out the door. After he was gone, I had to sit down. <laughs> Overwhelmed with joy and gratitude, I felt special, and I felt that perhaps I had what it took to be a professional ballet dancer. I felt that I felt as if I had managed to learn while watching the men's class and then stay open to feedback from someone who was clearly superior to me in every way. And he taught me that great people can be relatively normal and kind. He taught me that we all need to share what we have learned with others, and that is how we make a better world. It was a day in my life that I will never forget, a day filled with many special moments that altered me forever. It was a day when I began to recognize the games that can be played out in a ballet studio, a day where egos danced on a chessboard while trying to one-up each other. A day when I realized that to do what I wanted would require me to be aware of my own competitive spirit and to learn to master myself, it master myself in my mind and heart first. I understood that this would be the only way that I could possibly learn to master my own body and to find the strength to have the balance of mental and emotional control, and I realized that this would be the key to becoming a successful artist. I understood how powerful mo emotions were and how they would could demand excellence if the mind had enough discipline to move with meticulousness and grace. Somehow it seemed that I had been touched by fate in a unique way. I did not know what that meant exactly, but I knew that such a chance meeting that had happened would lead me on a path to another potential that was just awakening. While that would be my first and only encounter, with Mikhail Baryshnikov and Peter Martins. Shockingly, it would not be my last encounter with Peter Shofis and Rudolf Nureyev. Both would end up giving me great gifts that would carry me forward in unique ways. The universe has always given me lessons in foreshadowing of what was yet to come. The universe has always given me what I needed, not necessarily what I wanted. I was to learn how wise the universe truly was. Yet, there was much ahead of me. Now I am grateful that I could not see all the pieces that were going to fall into place and the moments that were intended to tear me apart. I am grateful to be in this place of knowing now and grateful that I have always followed my heart and my truth regardless of circumstances or events. I am grateful that I never lost my kindness even though I have been pushed to lose my temper in critical moments. Greatness does not come easily. There are many sharp edges that intend to tear at the fabric that the mind and heart create. All greatness is a force that one learns to surrender into as that higher knowing recognizes those places within us that need to die so that we can be reborn into something much faster and more wonderful than what we currently believe. Life is a cauldron that will burn away that which is unnecessary for a soul to learn to fly. Even that youthful moment I had something inside that knew the cost of my dream. She knew the cost of doing things outside the box of the cultural norms, and she was willing to pay the price for a chance at discovering what she knew was still hidden. Some part of me always heard the greatness inside my soul scratching to get out. I knew the part that was clawing her way into the limelight, and I understood the part of me that wanted to climb to the mountaintop Breathe in the coolness of the thin air and gaze at the incredible views that some moments offered. Thanks, everyone.